Hi, everyone. Thank you for hanging in there despite fire alarm, delays, hunger. We can make it through. The seats are comfortable, so I mean, it's a good place to be. Um, I'm Stefan. I'm going to talk about um, ERC-1400 and security tokens. Uh, but that's not what I'm sort of doing full time. Uh, I'm, I'm working with Numerai, and we're building an unstoppable marketplace for predictions. We are hiring, and I am giving out t-shirts. So if you're interested in that stuff, come talk to me offline. But what I'll be talking about is sort of my previous role um, as a digital securities researcher and some of the advisory work that I continue to do in the space. I was fortunate enough to work uh, at Polymath for a little bit, and I was a co-author on the ERC-1400 standard. So that's what this talk is going to focus on, is how do we represent digital securities on Ethereum? How has this standards first approach to re representing these securities evolved from when it was initially released in September to now? And where do we see it going in the future? Um, I've sort of split up the talk in, in two segments. The first one, a general overview of my own personal perspective on securities on a public blockchain, why it's there, is that something actually valuable? And the second part, what is ERC-1400 um, and what is the context around, uh, around the technology? So I'm not a securities lawyer. I'm a technologist, but I have sort of started to approach securities from more of a legal perspective. And what I've come to conclude is really where you look at tokens, whether they are securities or utilities, it's an abstraction of rights, an abstraction of ownership over a certain set of rights. So on any sort of ledger that you have, all you have is a certain balance associated with an identity. Um, all of the sort of value of that specific asset is derived by the rights that are associated with that ownership. For example, stocks, your rights are over voting, over dividends, and over liquidation. Same thing with bonds. We often talk about principal, interest, and liquidation rights. For derivatives, you get a little bit more fancy. You start talking about cash flows, risk, valuation. And for utilities, you're talking about access to a certain protocol, which often has network effects. So they're all sort of the same from a technology perspective. The rights are associated with it can be described in any way possible. Um, but there should be a, a common way to describe all of them uh, and, and, and separate out the different properties that you want to represent. So why are security tokens worthwhile. We already have securities, um, and it works pretty well. I mean, the financial system is quite inclusive in, in most modern countries. Um, so is there really demand for these things? Um, I just pulled here on the left of the screen the points that are raised by Stephen McKeenan um, on his article, which I invite you to read. I think it's probably the best overview of why do we tokenize in the first place. Um, the two points I'm particularly uh, interested in and the ones that a lot of people tend to talk about are increased liquidity. It's sort of a magic word in this security token space that there's going to be additional liquidity for all of these private market assets. Um, and it, it's a thesis that hasn't necessarily come to fruition yet, but something that is definitely valid and people are working on figuring out how do we unlock all this, this latent liquidity. Um, and then the other one that I'm particularly interested in is programmable securities. Um, what can you do, right, when you start to expand the design space for these securities, which are often limited in the traditional finance world by, you know, whatever the lawyers are comfortable signing up on um, and signing off on. Uh, there's sort of these implicit standards for the kind of products that, are able to, that you're able to offer that don't explore into sort of this vast... Uh, pool of interoperable assets and composable assets because the cost of the, the, the financial overhead of dealing with all these different systems is so high that it just doesn't allow you to, to build a business off of it. Um, and, and this is something that gets addressed once you have interoperable systems. Another two that I sort of added and, and on the right of the screen are international participation. Um, 
because blockchain technology is inherently international, uh, there's an opportunity to have participants and, and access markets, investor markets, from all around the globe. Uh, but obviously, this goes beyond the technology, right? It goes into standardization of a whole range of different services, you know, regulatory uh, standardization. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. The other one is freedom over substantive rights. So this is sort of a concept that hasn't had a lot of uh, attention, but um, it's very in line and in touch with the, the ideas of censorship resistance of public blockchains. And it's something that has been explored in the financial markets. I'll talk about that as well. So why use Ethereum? Um, securities are already distributed, right? You have, as uh, Xavier presented, sort of what the, the ecosystem looks like. And you have all these broker dealers, these custodians that uh, have all these different ledgers that they reconcile with each other to figure out who owns what. So it is very distributed, but it is not permissionless. Um, this is something that Gabriel Shapiro sort of uh, pointed me to. Um, he talks about certificated stock versus book entry stock. Um, the idea that in the past, what you would have as a stockholder into a company is a physical certificate that claimed the ownership over these rights. Um, and you were able to go in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, meet with a potential buyer, and transact with them. Um, so this right to dispose and to acquire was uncensorable from the company perspective, from the issuer perspective, and uncensorable from the perspective of other purchasers in the space or, or other stockholders for, for the company. Um, so these, these are sort of the substantive rights that come with ownership of, of stock that have not been replicated into the financial world that is now digitized. The way that it is structured now, you have broker dealers that manage sort of their own internal order books and then they delegate the actual holding of those stock certificate over to a central depository. Um, and if that particular broker dealer doesn't want you to perform a trade, they have all the freedom to prevent you from it. Using the blockchain, that's not the case anymore. Um, inside of the token itself, you can encode the rules that say whether or not an individual is able to transact. And there's no way to move away from those rules. Those, those rules become law in many ways. Um, so this distinction between substantive rights and intrinsic rights initially came out of um, the Geneva Securities Convention, which happened in uh, 2009. And it was really an effort to standardize the way that securities are modeled from a, a legal perspective around the world. Um, nothing came of it. They sort of had this convention discussed what would we want international law to reflect for securities. But as many international regulation happens, it needs to be demand driven, it needs to be market driven. And at the time, there just wasn't demand in the market for uh, the application of, the, of, uh, of these laws. So jumping into ERC 1400, what, what does that have to do with sort of what I've been talking about? I've been talking about a lot of legal stuff, uh, but ERC 1400 is it's a code. It's an interface. It's like ERC 20. Um, so I'm going to sort of say what is my perspective on how standards grow from simply code and actually inform the standardization of business processes and information flow inside of an ecosystem, inside of an industry, um, and how that helps inform legislators um, to sort of standardize their compliance requirements and, and think about how their assets can be represented worldwide. Um, the argument that I, that I make is that it has to be a code first initiative. Um, because the code and sort of the technology is what gives confidence for businesses to explore these different assets, explore integrating these assets. If they don't have a like, high level of confidence that all these assets are going to be able to talk to each other, you're going to end up with the same financial system that is now, where you have a lot of different systems that don't communicate very well. And then from behind the scenes, you have a bunch of standards organizations that re recognize that this, private, this prevents a lot of uh, new products from being developed. And then they retroactively try to standardize all of, um, all of their systems. But in this case, we have an opportunity to do that from the get-go. 
Um, and that's sort of what ERC-1400 tries to, to achieve, to look at the broad spectrum of what's required from modeling securities and provide a standard set of tools that anyone can use to fit any of their needs. Um, once we have a substantial amount of, of participation in that process, companies like custodians, broker-dealers, become confident in, in knowing this technology and building sort of their own infrastructure around it. Um, once they build this infrastructure around it, and there's many, many participants that build their business off of it, all of a sudden you have a demand for regulators to look at these standards, these processes, and then regulate accordingly. Um, and I think that's probably the only way that we're gonna be able to get regulators involved. So where are we today? I sort of talked about what's the thesis, what's the, what's the philosophy, what's the vision. Um, a lot has happened. So when we initially launched ERC-1400, it was sort of a monolithic standard that encompassed all of uh, the lessons learned that, that we had so far. Um, and uh, Adam has done an incredible job at separating out all the different components of that standard, uh, getting into how to actually create a family of standard that interoperates with each other um, and allows for different individuals, different issuers, and different jurisdictions to pick and choose the items that they need and avoid the complexity that comes with a monolithic implementation. So I, I've listed sort of some of the, the, the core components that at the code level uh, have been standardized so far are, are sort of public and, and um, people have contributed to. Um, it's only a start in many ways. There's, there's so much more that needs to be done. One of sort of the components that, that's at the bottom there is ERC 1616, which is about identity. It's about abstracting away a standard approach to doing access control on top of these tokens by taking sort of a, a HTTP certificate approach um, and having a trusted set of parties are able to say, uh, provide that identity verification uh, for multiple different tokens and therefore sort of pool that service. So um, these kinds of service uh, of standards are, are what's needed to, to really push this, uh, this effort forward. Um, in terms of the business side, the standardization of business processes, uh, I've seen a lot of movement from ISDA, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, around uh, standardizing information flow for derivatives trading. Um, and they're specifically targeted towards uh, things that happen on top of uh, smart contract platforms. Um, there's still a lot more to be done around pooling of liquidity between broker dealers, formation of, of syndicates for, uh, for these tokens, uh, around KYC and, and identity, um, around automated mo monitoring and, and reporting. I think you know, it, it's clear that all of a sudden regulators have access to like, a much broader wealth of information about these securities. There's a level of transparency that we've never seen before. Um, so we still need to sort of provide a, a good way to process that information, to ingest it and, and know what's important. Uh, and then token holder management. So uh, how do you actually help the companies that issue these tokens manage their cap table? How do you help them manage their, their documents and their shareholder communications? Um, these are all sort of things that can be uh, standardized and, and really business opportunities for people to come in um, and provide those services. On the legislation side, um, a lot of it has been around sort of standardizing compliance requirements. We saw recently uh, out of Wyoming the uh, legislation that uh, changes a lot of the wording around how corporate capital stock is represented and allows for uh, a smart contract on a blockchain to be the single source of truth around who owns what in a company, who owns these stock certificates. Um, and this is sort of one of many countries, many examples. Uh, in, in Singapore, the MAS and the, the Singapore Exchange are actively working with tech providers in trying to see if they can uh, bring forward this technology. And I know in Malta, the MFSA is actually hiring Solidity developers on their own staff 
So, you know, these regulators are, are taking quite a proactive role uh, and they're, they're willing to, to engage, they're willing to, to participate in the process, um, but they sort of waiting for the ecosystem to grow um, and, and to, uh, to de develop from a, from a technology perspective. What's next? Um, this is my call to action. This is my, this, this is my question to you guys. How do you guys want to participate um, in, this, in this process? Um, I have here a list of standards, which I think have not been written yet, technologies that haven't been explored yet, but are in demand. People need these things. Um, so if any of them are of interest to you, please you know, take them down, look at them, write a draft, send it to myself or anyone else uh, in, in, in this space and uh, we'll be happy to give feedback on it. Um, one of the quite you know, interesting ones uh, is, is confidential transaction. Um, the ability to bring this sort of privacy that's required by these, pu these uh, public market participants around uh, their transactions, their, their, um, their set of securities that they're actually holding um, and, and give them the level of privacy that they need this is sort of a, a big demand from a lot of industry folks. Um, and so if there's some standard around this, then great. I have also a few resources for you guys. So uh, we have three implementations that we've seen that are being actively maintained. If you want to go look at this ERC 1400 code, uh, and then you're free to contact me. That, there's my info. Send me any sort of question that you have. Um, I'm happy to engage. I want to open up the floor to questions. Thank you very much, very clear. Um, I was uh, wondering about what, what do you think about um, automation and standardization of the legal work uh, required, for example, for a uh, prospectus or something like that? Do you mean from like a regulatory perspective, what a regulator expects from a company to be able to issue uh, securities? Yes. That's gonna come like very far down the line, right? So. I've, I, the way that I see that playing out is there's two sides. There's sort of allowing a company to issue in a security, right, inside of a jurisdiction. And then inside that jurisdiction, what that regulator is also looking at is allowing uh, outside companies to sell their securities to their, uh, their uh, citizens. Um, so I think like those are sort of the two broad sides of that question. Um, from like a standardization of prospectus and like sort of the documents that are required, uh, as far as I know, there isn't any. Uh, every jurisdiction has their, their own approach to it. Um, and yeah, I haven't heard of, of sort of any efforts yet to try to standardize that. The, the sort of challenge that you have there is a lot of different markets have different information requirements. Um, and so it might be something that takes longer to happen. But do you think it's possible for a single ju jurisdiction, for example, uh, the USA or something? I think like they already have it, right? Like that's what securities legislation is about. Mm -hmm. All the different types of assets that you can issue is sort of a de facto standard that every company that wants to issue in that jurisdiction has to abide with. Yeah, uh, yeah I know in the Netherlands, uh, that's where I come from, um, the, the law is explicitly vague uh, right. uh, so that um, issuers um, hand over more information uh, than the bare minimum. Um, right. Um, yeah. So, so in the Netherlands, um, it's pretty hard to standardize uh, the creation of a, a prospectus, which, uh, yeah, which I think is also required to uh, to have SEOs uh, that are really cheap to issue. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think primary issuance cost is super high. It's like prohibitively high. Yeah. Um, and I don't really see that going down just mm -hmm. because, you know, regulators aren't familiar with these assets. They aren't familiar with 
uh, what are the, the goals, they, they sort of approach it with their existing regulatory framework and copy paste it over, which is fine, right? Like, it's okay. Uh, but it doesn't sort of meet the potential that it has. Um, the difficult thing about that is that you're, you're asking questions around uh, how do companies as a whole do reporting, uh, and you can't sort of select a certain set of requirements for companies that are trying to issue SEOs versus companies who are trying to issue using like the regular financial market. Um, it has to bridge both. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering what kind of efforts would you like to see from like the legal community? Where do you think most research is still needed? It's a big offer. Um, on the on the legal side, it's uh, I sort of base this talk around like a legal philosophy, right? Which is like how do we think about these rights and, and how do we want to manage them? Um, I think if there's a, a, an approach that says, here's sort of a simplified view on which jurisdictions uh, have compatible requirements, uh, compatible sort of frameworks for, for modeling these securities, um, it would sort of provide a, a good basis from which to then uh, you know, present to other jurisdiction and they can sort of self-select into the approach that they're interested in. Um, I, I know there's already a lot of effort from the legal community just to meet with these regulators uh, and educate them on the technology. But I, if, I think one of the, the core, you know, needs is around uh, identifying the core items that the technology uh, provides, sort of the core benefits of it, um, and then saying well, how does that bridge over into uh, the regulatory uh, standards that you know a certain set of countries have versus another set of countries which set of sort of uh, philosophies match better with certain implementations versus others um, so, so that connection between uh, the code the technology and and the legal side could be made uh, a lot clearer right because I think one of the main difficulties um what what we're trying to do with digital securities is basically trying to create an open, more global market, right? Could you talk a little bit louder? Yeah, sure. So what we're trying to do with digital securities is basically trying to create a more open, more international market, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said. Of course, the difficulty with that is that you're dealing with a lot of jurisdictions at the same time, yeah. where each jurisdiction is going to have different uh, laws regarding as to property law, uh, KYC, AML implementation, uh, securities laws, etc. right? So, um, you know, when you say you, of course, it would be nice to have a better overview of um, what are the limitations per country, but I think for a single um, securities offering or digital security, it's very difficult to take all, um, all variances in each country um, in mind, um, and I was wondering if, if if there's any kind of solution you could think of. Just it doesn't have to be right now, right? But it's like a good thinking point, I think, for the whole yeah, industry. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Right, like that. You both in these questions raised the, the, some of the core issues uh, and, and questions that uh, issuers have with launching their securities. One of them is, you know, how much is it going to cost me to actually do all the compliance requirements on the primary issuance? And the second one is like, how do I access investors overseas? How do I access uh, bigger pockets of capital? Um, I think from, from that specific question, right, my intuition tells me there are certain jurisdictions where the regulations are more compatible and closer together than other. Um, I haven't seen like a proper analysis on what those are. I would love to be able to see that and see, you know, maybe like uh, an overview of these specific jurisdictions are leaning in this direction versus these other jurisdictions are leaning in this other direction. Um, that would be an incredibly useful report for I think everyone in the space to see. Thank you. Okay, so if there's nothing else, thank you so much for listening. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to have a 30 minutes.